So we're going to talk about Parvo today. Oops, you did that already. Um, so what is Parvo virus? Um, in the U.S., as of July of 2020, there's been an increased number of cases since COVID. Um, it was kind of interesting that the coronavirus pandemic has caused an increased number of cases. Um, and we think initially it was a decreased number of routine visits or vaccines. I guess the first six months of the um, pandemic, people just stopped going places here um, just in fear of anything. And so there was a, an uptick in actually parvovirus cases. Um, and then there was an increased number of visits of dog parks, um, of dogs to dog parks and social places with pets because people weren't going anywhere. So they kind of stayed home and kind of started socializing their pets with other dogs. So that was kind of interesting, uh, but just kind of a backup, a review of diarrhea. Um, did anybody, everybody knows that there's different kinds. So osmotic diarrhea is super watery. It's caused by viral infections, um, basically non-absorbed substances in the gut pull water in, and it's just water that comes out. So there's the osmotic diarrhea. Secretory diarrhea is usually caused by bacterial infections. And this diarrhea usually has a mucosal lining to it. Um, clostridial diarrhea causes this really commonly. You'll see that mucus lining outside the stool. Um, and then exudative diarrhea is caused by viral infections such as parvo, which causes damage to the gut lining that causes a loss of proteins and everything from the gut and it comes out. So, so you have those different kinds of diarrhea. So the first thing is to try and figure out what kind of diarrhea are you dealing with initially since parvo usually causes diarrhea and vomiting. And then there's the motility associated diarrhea. So an ileus, um, they ate something, caused something to be stuck, um, or you've got a hyper motility gut, which is um, they eat something that the body's just trying to expel. So you get decreased absorption that causes the diarrhea. Um, so there's just different kinds of diarrhea. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at a dog. Um, so intestines, here's, here's your anatomy review. So you've got your GI tract with the small intestines. And then in the fold of the intestinal linings, there's the little villi that have the epithelial cells lining. And it's those little villi, so those individual ones, and they have the little microvilli on there. And it's the little, those little hairy guys. And what happens with um, parvovirus, at least, is that it destroys that lining. Um, and it takes... It can take five to seven days for the villi to re replenish after an insult, um, which is why generally when we treat, when I treat diarrhea, at least we treat it for two weeks just to make sure it's clear. Um, but it's five to seven days, usually they're better. Um, but we usually treat them with um, medication a little bit longer just to make sure that that gut has replenished. So parvovirus, um, the virus gets into the lymph node tissue either fecal oral or from the saliva moves into circulation and then goes to rapidly dividing cells and replicates there. So everybody knows that, you know, in general, it causes um, damage to the intestines. So the crypt cells, like we just talked about, are damaged. You get mucosal lining loss that causes the vomiting and the diarrhea, but it can also go into the bone marrow, um, which can cause anemia and leukopenia. So your white blood cell count can be very low. And then the last place it goes is the cardiac muscle. And if it goes there, it causes sudden death. Um, it's more rare, but a lot of, but it can happen. And those are the dogs that just die suddenly and there's nothing you can do. Um, the bone marrow, if the, when we see a, a dog that's sick, we'll run blood work. If the white cell count is very low and they have a fever, that is a very poor prognostic indicator of how that pet is going to do. So the infection takes four days to get into the intestines and the symptoms will show by day seven. So um, it takes four days for the intestine, for the infection to move. So when they, when they're actually sick, they were exposed at least four to seven days ago. So just something to keep in mind. So how infectious is it? Super, right? So the virus lives five to seven months in a dry environment and up to a year in a moist environment. It lives in the dirt which is why it's super important for vaccines. Um, increased number of infections after the rain or during the raining season. So if you notice, I don't know if you guys see more, oops, sorry. Whew. If you see more cases in the rainy season than you do um, not, but I'm assuming that you probably would. 
I know when it's wetter here, I live in the south um, east of the US and when it's the summer, we do see a little uptick in cases. Um, so one gram of infected feces can infect 10 million sus susceptible dogs. So it doesn't take much to affect the dogs. And then a puppy vaccinated up to 12 weeks is only 82% protected. So need to be vaccinated every four weeks until five months of age. And I will go over that again at the end on prevention. So who's susceptible? So dogs in shelters, pet stores, boarding kennels, any place where there's a large group of dogs together. So if you have a bunch of dogs in a yard together, if one dog gets it, it goes into the environment and that area is potentially infectious up to a year. Dogs six weeks to four months of age is the normal kind of age range for it. Um, older dogs that get infected with it, those dogs just kind of linger and they're sick for a long time. Um, some of the breeds that are more susceptible, the, it's kind of a joke. We joke that it's the black and tan dogs. So the Rotties, the Dobermans, German Shepherds, and then American Pit Bulls seem to be more susceptible to the virus. In India, so it was first isolated in 1982 is when, you, when we first saw it there. A new strain was found in 2001. Um, it is more prominent in the Northern states, but can be seen all over India. Um, and the isolates are, are a different lineage than the Southeast Asian isolates. So there's different, it's, it's interesting. So if you think about viruses like COVID, <laughs> there's different isolates of COVID. Parvo has different isolates as well. Um, generally you treat them all the same. Um, so again, clinical signs. So we're looking for that profuse, watery, exudative diarrhea. Okay, remember that that's the one that's caused by that, the lack of lining of the GI tract. A lot of times the diarrhea has blood in it and it has a very pungent odor. Um, so if you, you know, most people know the smell of Parvo. It has a very specific smell. Um, a lot of these dogs will be vomiting as well, not eating. Um, some dogs will be painful on abdominal palpation and that will worsen. The pain seems to worsen a little bit as we start treatment, because as you restart the gut moving um, and the nerve endings get regenerized and they start to be more painful. A lot of these dogs will have a fever. If they have a fever again, that's kind of a poor prognostic indicator. Some dogs don't have a fever. It just depends on the dog. Most of them are very dehydrated. Sometimes they'll come in in shock or if they're really little, they'll be having seizures from being hypoglycemic from the amount of volume loss. Um, and they can get secondary infections on their skin, UTIs, other places because their immune system has been um, whacked basically by the virus. So who likes to attack with parvo? It seems like worms seem to be their best friend. So there's always, parasites uh, as well as parvo there. So you've got roundworms, tapeworms, hookworms, whipworms, all these guys can be in there at the same time. Um, so I always treat every parvo case I see with ivermectin, which is 0.1 cc's per five kilograms subcutaneously. We just give it once when they first come in. Um, and then generally the dogs that we do that on are survive better. And I think if you do kill off the worms, which are the extra um, basically taking an extra load on that, off of that intestine, um, it does survive longer. Okay. Um, diagnosis. So how do we diagnose this? Um, exam, obviously, when you do your exam, you're looking for dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, um, stool check if possible, or the smell test, um, just that wonderful smell that Parvo has. And just keep in mind, we always check the stool for parasites as well. So we just do the fecal float and see if we see anything else. I treat them with ivermectin regardless, just in case. Um, and then clinical signs, same thing. There is a parvo test, a SNAP parvo test, which is an antibody test um, that will run, um, it looks like this, where you stick the little stick up in the butt and then you move the conjugate, stick it on the little SNAP. Um, Unfortunately, this test, you can be a false negative in the first three to five days of the disease. So sometimes the dogs will test negative. We'll still assume it's parvo, treat it for parvo, and then I'll test them before they leave. And then they'll, be, they'll test positive at that point. So um, a leukopenia, so decreased white blood cells is really common. Other things we'll see on blood work is a low albumin. And again, that's just from all the fluid loss. 
low platelets, um, low cholesterol, potassium, sodium, all those things that they get from eating and being able to absorb food, all that stuff is lower. Um, and you can get a mild liver enzyme and um, renal values can be elevated as well. And it just, again, it depends on the disease of the dog and what part of them is affected. So how do we treat it? The most important thing is supportive care. So it's a race, it's a race against time. So parvovirus kills from causing them to dehydrate. So the goal is to hydrate them faster than the virus is killing off the intestines. And we give antibiotics to prevent secondary infections. Um, and the treatment goals, decrease gut secretions, increase absorption of nutrients, give them nutrition, and then stop the vomiting as best as you can. Um, but fluids are the most important. So fluids, fluids, fluids. So um, again, the goal is to beat the virus through a race against dehydration. So, you know, IV fluids, if possible, subcutaneous fluids, if it's not possible, um, the best thing you can do is just keep getting fluids in those animals. So the fluids are treating the shock. Um, and so you can use, so if they're really shocky, you want to try and give a fluid that re resembles plasma. So lactated ringers are good. Um, sometimes I'll actually give them plasma. If they're super dehydrated, you want to, same thing, you're using something that has, that resembles extracellular fluids like the sodium chloride or lactated ringers. Sodium chloride works just as well. Um, you've got the gut loss through the vomiting dehydration, sodium chloride, or you can use LRS plus KCL. Although I, I don't know about you guys, but in the US, potassium chloride's on back order <laughs> for like the last six months. Um, and then you want to keep them on maintenance fluids just to prevent the continued loss through the air um, and the urine. And again, you know, a lot of times I just put these dogs on LRS um, and then, or sodium chloride and just kind of go with it. Um, the fluid rate is at least twice their weight in kilograms. Um, if you're doing a rate on it, sometimes if they're really dehydrated, I'll run them at three or four times their weight um, a little while, and then I'll back off. Um, if you're doing subcutaneous fluids, it's hundred mils per five kilograms. Um, and you probably want to do that at least every day or sometimes twice if needed. And then plasma. So if, if you have access to plasma and the dogs are really sick, um, it's five to 10 mils per kilogram. It isn't readily available. We have some in a freezer, um, but it, again, it's not, not everybody has that. So, um, and then you want to give them some antiemetics to stop the vomiting. So, you know, metoclopramide, you can add it to the bag of fluids. You can give it subcutaneously. You can do an IV or I usually put it in the bag just to let it run continuously if we're doing IV fluids and it's two cc's per, uh, you know, liter bag. Um, ser serenia or meripotent can be given subcutaneously or IV. Um, you can use both of those together if they continue to vomit. Um, there's another drug. Undasteron you can use. It's a serotonin inhibitor. Um, that's helpful. And then, you know, some people will actually put a tube, an NG tube in and pull the fluid out of the stomach. Cause as that, it just kind of sits and churns. Um, if you could just get it out, get it emptied and then let the stomach rest, um, then you can start adding stuff in. Um, you want to try and reduce stomach acid secretions. So famotidine or ranitidine um, it can be given IV. You can also give it subcutaneously. Um, omiprazole or pantoprazole is like injectable Prilosec pretty much, or omiprazole, reduces gastric acid secretions, but it can take a couple of days to take effect. So a lot of times I'm gonna use both of these guys together. So Crowfate is oral. Um, it increases stomach mucus production. So it's you, usually good if you're worried about a stomach ulcer, you can give it in a slurry. If you take one of these tablets, you can um, put it in water, make it into a slurry and squirt it down the throat. It does come as a liquid as well. Um, and then mesoprostol increases blood flow and stomach mucus secretions. That drug is not readily available here um, either, um, but that would be another thing if you had it on hand. And then again, you want to treat the secondary infections. So we're looking at amoxicillin, penicillin, metronidazole, enrofloxacin, or cephalosporin. Um, a lot of times I treat them with metronidazole. I'll put them on cefazolin if they're in the hospital and enrofloxacin. Um, if I'm treating them not in the hospital and we're doing subcutaneous, we'll try and do the fluids under the skin. If you can give them a shot of penicillin, that's great. Um, if you do that every three days and see if that helps. Um, but any of, any of these or all of these or whatever you can do to prevent that secondary infection. 
So as that GI tract is just losing its lining, it's more susceptible for bacterial translocation. And then it's time to feed the gut. So you wanna fast it initially for the first 12 hours, 24 hours if needed. I try and not do it too long, um, just to kind of let some of that fluid leave the stomach. And then you can start trying to give them a little bit of sugar. Um, we'll give them some dextrose orally um, initially, or we can give it sub-Q or IV um, if they're not eating yet. Um, you can make a glucose electrolyte solution with 50% dextrose. You just take a bag of LRS, take 50 mils out, put 50 mils in, and then you have a 5% solution. So you can either give that IV or you can give it orally actually. Um, and then you want to switch to a liquid bland diet. <laughs> hey, 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 guys. Um, so like science diet, low fat or royal canin, low fat would be good. And then you switch them. Once they're eating, you want to keep them on a bland diet for at least, you know, I, I say at least two weeks, but once they're, they're eating, you want to keep them on that for a little while, just to let that gut, give that gut time to reset. And then survival. So 50% of cases will survive with aggressive treatment. So that's always something, a good conversation to have with the owners is say, you know, 50% of patients will die. 50% um, will survive. We're hoping that you're on the 50% of survival end. Um, but even with aggressive treatment, some of them will still die. If a dog lives past the first four days, you have a greater chance of survival. And again, those older puppies that are, you know, the ones that are six or eight months that get it, those ones will linger. A lot of times we'll, they'll be in the hospital with us for a week or two weeks um, until they're better. But most puppies will rebound and do better within the first two to three days. Poor prognostic indicators are again, is having a fever and a low white cell count. So, you know, if they come in and they have a really bad fever, if it's 103, 104, five or 105, and they don't have any white blood cells, that's pretty poor prognostics. Um, and with, even with plasma and everything, they're probably still going to die no matter what you try. So, um, and so, you know, in the hospital, we'll put them on IV fluids, IV antibiotics, give them sub Q ivermectin, get them on antiemetics and trickle feed. So that's, you know, the ideal situation if you can get them in the hospital. This is our hospital isolation room. We have a separate area in the hospital that's away from our normal hospitalized patients where we will put dogs with parvo um, just to prevent anybody else, especially the other puppies coming in from getting it in the field. You can give them subcutaneous fluids, sub-Q antibiotics, ivermectin again, antiemetics, and then slowly introducing food, um, even like a Pedialyte or a electrolyte type solution, Gatorade, um, they can try and give that orally as well. Um, but any of those will work. Um, and the frustrating thing is sometimes that there's sequela to parvo infection. So even if they survive the initial parvo is things can happen later on. Um, Intussusceptions are pretty common and always, and I'm always on the lookout for those. So if I have a, a case of parvo, that's, it's just, he's better, but he's not, and he's lingering and he, he do it's good for, you know, a day or two. And then he starts vomiting again. I get really worried about intussusceptions. Um, and that's just from the hypermotility. Um, as they get older, they can get a polyarthritis. Um, they get phlebitis normally. They can throw an embolism. You can get renal infarctions and sudden death. So it's, it can be frustrating because they're doing good. And then suddenly they're not. <laughs> so just be aware, like, even if you do everything you can, um, it's, it's a virus and it does what it wants. And then eventually, you know, some dogs can get endocarditis or cardiomyopathy, um, later on as well. Most important is parvo is a preventable disease. Um, so prevention is much easier than treatment. So again, you know, even it's frustrating because a lot of these dogs you treat and you work really hard on them and then they still die. <laughs> um, the goal is not for them not to die, but it, it does happen sometimes, but prevention is a lot easier. So there is, you know, vaccination is really important. It's cheaper than the treatment. Obviously I know for us, a, a case in the hospital can be very expensive and a lot of owners can't afford that. Um, and so there is, there's vaccines out there. Um, the vaccine that we use generally is in a combination with the distemper and adenovirus. Um, so you want to, and you want to make sure if possible that the mother dog is vaccinated prior to becoming pregnant. If we vaccinate one that is pregnant, there is a likelihood because it is a modified live vaccine that we pass the actual disease onto the puppies. Um, so that is always a concern. You wanna make sure that the, that the um, mother dog is not pregnant prior to vaccines, but we want them vaccinated before they become pregnant because it helps with immunity for those puppies. 
And then generally if mother's immunity will hold, um, you don't have to vaccinate the puppies until they're eight weeks. So at 60 days, 90 days, and then 120 days. And then at 20 weeks that generally we, that's our vaccine schedule is we see them at eight, 12, 16, 20 weeks, and then at a year. And then the vac then the vaccine's pretty much good for three years after that. So then every three years, but to make sure that they are continually um, vaccinated. And this is the immunity in puppies. So if we look at if mom has good immunity that will pretty much hold until about eight weeks or so. And the window of susceptibility is between, you know, six, seven weeks up to 11 weeks. Um, and their immunity levels will go up and then they come down and it's just as their body's developing their own immune system as those titers go up and down, which is why it's really important to boost that vaccine. Oh, same thing. So really important to vaccinate. There you go. Oh, I guess that's it. Well, that was fast. So this is some of my children. Does anybody have any questions? And it looks like we've got some in the chat. So let me go to that. Um, in the chat, we say, you guys see it all year round. Yeah. Um, you can give the sacralfate orally and then, um, and generally when we use sacralfate orally, we use it twice a day or three times. How frequently do you recommend to give diet to parvo patients while treatment? So when we're treat when we're feeding those dogs, I'm, I'm trying to feed them three or four times a day, a small amount of food just to keep things going. Um, because you just want to try and keep getting food into those animals. Um, indication of ivermectin and parvo treatment. So the reason we give ivermectin is again, to prevent that secondary parasite load. So a lot of these dogs actually die because the parvo kills the intestinal lining and allows those worms to take over. And then they'd actually die from worm involvement. So we give the ivermectin to prevent that. Is there any role of probiotics in parvo? Absolutely, I love probiotics. Um, it, you just have to get it in them. <laughs> so, you know, that's, I always, they always go home when they're doing better, I send them home with um, probiotics because you want to help rebuild that gut flora. So that's super important. In some cases, there'll be a high white cell count. So could it be acute phase of infection or parvo or mixed infection? Yeah, so if they have a high white cell count, that's a good sign that their body is trying to fight off that infection. So that's a really good thing. If it's low, that's a poor prognostic indicator, but high is actually a good thing. Um, there's the, aver the avermectin question again. <laughs> um, in some cases, there's low white cell counts. Do you recommend any medicine for that or be a, get okay after a few days? It depends on the dog. So if their white cell count is really low, those are the dogs that are potentially not gonna survive. Um, so if you do a CBC and their white cell count is like 0 0.2, you're in trouble. Um, but if some of those guys, if you treat them really, really aggressively and give them two or three antibiotics with, you know, fluids and possibly plasma, they might survive. Um, but again, it's a conversation that I have with the owners. Okay. What will the vaccine schedule for a dog who has unvaccinated initially get infected with parvo and then recover? So for anybody that gets parvo, you still want to vaccinate them normal. So if it's an, in a dog that, that was unvaccinated, got parvo, Usually what I do is after two weeks after they clear the infection is go ahead and vaccinate them. And then I boost that in a month and then they're usually done. Um, so that's all they need because they've been exposed once. Should we try DNS fluids in Parvo? I don't know what DNS fluids is. Who's DP? I might need more on that. Okay, we'll come back to that one. If a mother's not vaccinated and then at one age, can she start vaccine? So as, as long as she's not pregnant, you can vaccinate, you can vaccinate a dog at any age for it. You, you just remember if it's an older dog, you want to boost that dog in a month and then it's good for a year. Um, so if you can get a, a you want to vaccinate any dog. So any dog that we're vaccinating for rabies or, you know, when I'm out in the field, I'm giving them distemper parvo with the rabies. And then I'm going to try and boost that distemper parvo in a month. What should we do if hypoproteinemia condition and gastrointestinal parvo infection? So the best thing, so if your protein levels are low or tanked because of the parvo, that's really common. Um, and it's the same thing. You just, you want to give them some fluids. Again, if you have plasma, that helps. If you don't have plasma, you want to start trying to get some food in these guys and get them to hold it down. Because the only way to kind of get that protein level back up is to give them 
some nutrition, they need something to kind of pull the fluid back in. So they're not having as much of as of an as osmotic diarrhea issue. Okay. For preventing circulatory collapse, what colloids do you recommend any role of blood transfusion? I generally don't do a blood transfusion, um, but if they are down and out and they're, everything is tanking, it's not a bad idea. Again, we have plasma, so I use that. But if you have blood or you want to try that, it's not a bad idea because it does help with the shock. Um, but in generally, I just use either lactated ringers or sodium chloride fluids. Okay. What fluid combination and daily once or twice a day fluid therapy? So if you're using fluids IV, again, you can use your sodium chloride, your lactated ringers. You can put dextrose in it. You can put metoclopramide in it. Sometimes I'll put vitamin B complex in the bag. <laughs> um, and you can give it, if you're running it IV, you just continue it on, you know, twice maintenance if possible. If you're doing it subcutaneously, it depends on how dehydrated the dog is. So if you do it, you know, if you do it in the morning and the dog absorbs it all really fast, you probably want to give another dose that night. All right. Could not get fun. Okay. So the ivermectin question again, everybody understands that. Let me know if you don't. Um, relevance of parvo treatment after the dog showing clinical signs like bloody diarrhea. Parvo can lob treatment. I don't know what can lob is. Dextrose. Maybe that was the other one. DNS fluids was dextrose, maybe. Um, okay, dextrose and normal saline. And you can use, so you can use the dextrose and normal saline fluids. Um, okay, so that was that question up there, which was, should we try DNS fluids at parvo? Absolutely. You can give fluids with the dextrose in it for parvo treatment. That is a very good idea. Especially if they're not eating, you can just do that. That works. Okay. After how many days of parvo infection do you recommend parvo vaccine in the same dog? So within two weeks is a good idea. After they've cleared it, you can go ahead and vaccinate them. I used to vaccinate them when they left the building, but then I realized that that probably wasn't helping. Their immune system probably wasn't holding that first vaccine. So I usually wait two weeks, then vaccinate it. Can you give the hydroxyethyl starch as plasma volume expander? Yes, you can. Absolutely. That um, we don't have that anymore <laughs> in the U.S. So yes, if you have it, use it. Absolutely, it does help, and especially if their protein levels are low. Um, do you need to give a blood coagulant injection? I usually don't. Um, the best, and then the next question is how to maintain blood glucose in the body, and that's giving that dextrose solution or trying to get them on food. So that's really important. Um, how can you stop bleeding because any hemostatic, not, what is your plan? So generally, if we don't, if they're having very, very bloody diarrhea, the best thing to do again is, is your, it's a race against time. So if you can get some antibiotics in them, get some fluids in them, generally that can stop because the bleeding is coming from the sloughing of the gut. So if you can, if you can try and get that to stop or slow down with the fluid therapy, that does seem to help. Does vitamin C play a significant role in recovery from parvo? Generally, no, but it doesn't hurt. So <laughs> if you have it, give it. Um, I use B complex because um, it seems to just give them a little bit of a boost. Do cats or felines get parvo? They have their own form of parvo. It's called um, feline panleukopenia. It looks like dog parvo where they have diarrhea, they vomit. It's the exact same thing, but it's just called panleukopenia. Um, and in cats, it can cause, so panleukopenia actually can cause um, sloughing of the cerebellum as well. So a lot of those cats, if, kittens, if they get it at a young age, will be a little bit ataxic as they get older. Um, okay, canaglib is a parvoimmunoglobulin. Oh, we don't have that. Does that work? That's cool. Okay, fluid dose rate um, is at least twice maintenance. So for us, maintenance is their weight in um, mils, but for you guys, it would be weights in kilogram. Is the available vaccine will cover all new strains? So generally, that yes, the vaccine for parvovirus will cover all of the strains in general. I don't know one that doesn't work. Um, how to prevent Rottweiler puppy from parvo? They generally die, in, yeah, due to cardiac arrest. And again, those Rottweiler puppies, the Dobermans, those black and tan dogs generally do worse and they don't know why there's there's some sort of it used to they used to say vaccinate them longer because 
they are the ones that are more susceptible. They don't know there's some gene missing in their immune system that generally they just don't do well with parvo. So yeah, those are the ones that are going to just die on you, no matter what you do. And there's not a whole lot you can do. You just have to treat it the same. There's not a whole lot you can do to prevent that. Unfortunately, it's just frustrating. Um, can you use atropine? I generally don't use atropine for parvo unless they're super drooly. You can give them an injection subcutaneously. Um, but generally I don't use it a whole lot because a lot of times their heart rates are a little bit high anyway from being dehydrated. Can you use steroids? I generally don't do steroids again because of the immune system. If the immune system is um, weakened from the virus and you give them steroids, it could make it worse. And then those secondary infections will take over. Okay, so vaccinate. There's the same question. Vaccinate two weeks after they recover. In a parvo outbreak, what steps to be taken in the hospital to prevent infection? So if you get it in your hospital, bleach. Bleach will kill it. Um, if we get it, if we have a dog that goes outside in our yard that has parvo, we realize we'll, we'll actually go outside and bleach the yard, um, the poor grass, but whatever. <laughs> um, but bleach is the best way to prevent it. Um, okay, please mention fluid dose rate and give mm -hmm. vaccine. Okay, so the fluid dose rate again is twice maintenance um, at least, or you can go up to three or four times. You can give, don't you, but generally don't want to vaccinate a pregnant female in general, until after the puppies are off of her. Um, BC, okay, the, the, I'm assuming that's B complex and parvo is the vitamin that just, it just gives them an extra boost. So Crowfate given orally, yep, frequency and dose. So the dose of Sacralfate, um, <laughs> here's, here's their doctor wages dose. It's a tablet or a, a gram per big dog half a gram for a, a middle-sized dog and then, you know, quarter for a little puppy. So it just kind of depends on how big it is. I mean, you, again, I dissolve it in water and then squirt it down their throat. Um, and I generally do that two or three times a day, depending on the dog. Um, is the available parvo immunoglobulins really effective? We don't have that in the U S so I don't know the answer to that question at all. Um, so. <laughs> The Vanguard from Zoetis, is that covering all strains of Parvo? Yes. Um, pantoprazole, IV is ideal method treatment. So pantoprazole you can use, it, it helps. It's not, you, you wanna try and treat with antibiotics more than the stomach protectants. Um, and acetylcysteine might help. That's another thing if you have it. Um, how many strains of Parvo is now persisting? I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, I looked at it a couple or last year, but I haven't really looked at it this year. But it, in general, you can treat them all the same. Um, is temper if temperature is subnormal, what do you do? You start praying. <laughs> um, those are the dogs that are going to be really sick. Um, but you just treat them aggressively the best you can. Give them generally, if the temperature is low, they're going to get metronidazole, cefazolin, Batril from me. Um, the bleach dose is ten percent bleach to clean things. Um, the dose rates of misoprostol, I actually would have to look that one up. I don't know the one off the top of my head. That drug is not available right now, so we generally don't use it. Um, and then, I don't know what that is. Ma'am, please suggest whether etosimilate can help in treatment. So if anybody knows the answer to that one, feel free. <laughs> there you go. Indication for mesoprostol is, again, that's the, if they're vomiting a whole lot, you can try it. It does help to um, soothe down the stomach area. So. Um, for abdominal cramps and often diarrhea, can we use? Yeah, you can. I'm assuming that's Beva. Um, you can give, you can give pain meds. If they seem uncomfortable, you can give them some buprenex or whatever. I generally, um, it depends on the dog. Um, usually the, once they get on the fluids, they seem to do better. And so crawfate, again, that's the oral, um, tummy coater that you can use. So, it, you know, it comes in tablets. So the big tablet for a big dog quarter for a puppy. So that's generally what we do. Can you give head of starch subcutaneously? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think you can because I think it can cause some abscessing. Um, 
if, he, if you're going to treat them subcutaneously, I think I would just do some fluids and just try and get some Pedialyte or something in, else in orally if you can. Um, but that head of starch, my feeling is that you're probably going to get a little bit of an abscess. Best combination of antibiotics to prevent secondary infection. Metronidazole is my go-to if you have it. If you don't, you know, you can use a penicillin or an ampicillin. Um, you can give them enrofloxacin. Batril is always good to have in your back pocket for anything, right? Amikacin. It, the, the thing with amikacin is it's generally not safe in dogs. It can cause kidney failure. So I steer clear from that one completely. Um, can you share lecture notes to mail? I, Dr. Um, Dixon will post them on the VetNet Foundation website. Um, for a very serious case, do you recommend adrenal subcutaneously to prevent shock? Again, if they're really shocky, you do what you can to try and save them. So you can give them some epinephrine or if you, if you need to, to prevent the shock, um, but fluids, 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 it's, it is a, it's a fluid treatment. That's the best way to treat them. So you're welcome. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, orally, do you, do you recommend oral doses during vomiting? That is uh, electrolytes and other um, uh, glucose and all during vomiting. So if, if they're vomiting, the, the, if they're vomiting, you need to try and get the vomiting. You want to get the vomiting to stop first. So okay. you want to, you want to treat the vomiting first. Once they're not vomiting is when you try and start the orals, but they need to not be vomiting for a little bit before you try and get stuff in. Otherwise you're at risk for aspiration pneumonia. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, some more comments are in the chat box. So yeah, so there's one combination of Ceph, Troxone, and Amikacin. I am not familiar with those, um, so I couldn't tell you, but somebody said it works excellent. So if it works for you guys, go for it. Feeding while in treatment. Yeah, I would, once they're not vomiting, then I start feeding them. And again, we'll start with a dextrose solution and then work them up to um, actual real food. So why the ivermectin? So again, ivermectin, if you give them, it's, um, it's for us 0.1 cc's per 11 pounds sub Q, but um, if you give, so it's 0.1 per five kilograms sub Q, if you give it to them initially, it will help kill any parasites that are in there that can cause a secondary infection. So it was funny. I told, um, some of my Navajo veterinary friends that, and the next year when I went out there, they were like, we haven't lost a dog to Parvo since. <laughs> so it does seem to help. Metronidazole is my favorite antibiotic. I absolutely love that one for anything GI. So I use it all the time. Absolutely. We give it IV. You can give it oral once they're eating, if you don't have it IV. Um, but if you don't, again, if you don't have it IV, then I would be doing, you know, penicillin, ampicillin, anything else you can get until they're eating and then switch them over. For a healthy gut, can you suggest curd feeding and Sprolac? I don't know what that is, but I generally don't use anything that is dairy in dogs because they don't, can't digest it. You can use, although you can use Ensure, um, if you guys have that, um, the people thing, you can use that. You can force feed with a feeding tube if you need to, but again, make sure they're not vomiting if you do that because you do not want them to aspirate. Any use of Stipnix? I don't know what that is either. Blood clotting agents to arrest bleeding. You know, the blood clotting stuff, you can try it. I don't, I don't use anything generally. The bleeding usually stops once you can get the fluids on board. The role of potassium, if they are vomiting a ton, a little bit of potassium and not eating well, a little potassium does help with that and it makes them feel better. So it's not a bad idea. Currently our potassium chloride, which is an injectable, is not available in the US. So we generally, we haven't been using it because we don't have it. Um, sulfa drugs, if you don't have anything else, it's better than nothing. So, but in general, I try and use the other things first because sulfa drugs can affect the GI tract as well. And so 
it can make them worse. <laughs> but if you don't have anything else, it's okay. For oral feeding, can we use uh, fruit juices or tender coconut or white of the egg? Yeah, egg whites are great. I would steer clear from the coconut because of the fat content in it. Um, but apple juice, things like that, absolutely. Things that are bland. Egg whites, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, dextrose just orally, or can you give it IV? So you can give dextrose orally, you can give it IV, you can give it sub Q, however you want to do it. Yep. So the, here's the answer on that. At a assimilate, I'm probably killing that one. And a hammer and an anchor fully to work by increasing resistance. So yeah, I mean that if that's something that you guys have access to, it might it's not gonna hurt, it might actually help that at a assimilate the antihemorrhagic agent. Yeah, we don't have anything like that here. If the hemoglobin is low, shall we do aggressive flame? Yes, again, so if you're gonna need some fluid therapy to help um, with treatment and then we hope that the other stuff kind of recovers so dose rate of potassium and when to start if they're vomiting a bunch and they are not eating well so generally if you have access to potassium if it's oral you could give them a little bit um i would probably if it's the tablets you probably just want to start on a half a tablet for a little puppy which is 10 pounds or less um if you have the injectable it's two cc's into the bag into a liter bag for a dog um, fed, read some more fecal route introduction of healthy bacteria to par parvo infected. Yeah, the fecal transplantation is still fairly new. I haven't ever tried it. Um, generally, these dogs are so sick that I, the last thing I want to do is give them somebody else's infections. So I generally, I don't know. If, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard that that would help with parvo yet. Um, but that's something to look into. Is there any predilection for myocarditis? Yeah. So it depends on the dog um, for the myocarditis. It's rare. I've probably seen it twice. Um, so it is super rare, but it can happen um, where the dogs get better and then they die suddenly. And it's just, you know, those are those frustrating cases. Um, oh, there you go. There's another uh, treatment for the bleeding. The low market can be used rather than, yeah. You can use colloids if you have it again, then that's a great idea. If you don't have it, whatever you have is the best thing to use. How good is the use of botropes and cardo? I don't know the answer to that one either. You guys have stuff. I don't know. Um, main reason for vaccine failure in puppies. It's, it's not the vaccine failure per se. It's their immune systems haven't developed yet, which is why you need to boost them every you know, we do it every four weeks. You can do it within every two to three weeks if needed. Um, so that's another option as well, but it's, it's just, it's their immune system just doesn't develop as well to parvo. So you just have to keep vaccinating them. Um, a Steinman. I'm not sure what that is. If anybody else does answer in the chat box. <laughs> Immunoglobulins used in parvo case. Again, that is something that we don't have in the US, so I've never used it. Um, but if anybody else has used those immunoglobulins for parvo, please respond and yeah. Dose rate of fluids and how to decide based on body weight. So, so generally we do, our fluid rate is twice maintenance. So, and then the maintenance fluids are based on their body weight. So for us, um, it's a mil, a mil per pound. So for you guys, it'd be half a mil per kilogram. For it was, and then you want to go twice that, so a mil per kilogram. Okay, botrymase in, injection is used to control bleeding surgical dental. Oh, snake venom. Oh, that's the same thing. Yeah. So some people say that this um, botrymase or whatever that mixture seems to be helpful. So if you want to try it, but this crawfade seems to be better, according to this person. So there you go. Fluid administration, we just talked about that. So you want to go twice regular maintenance, at least. If they're really dehydrated, go higher.
Okay. Uh, any more questions? Fluid therapy intervals. So um, if you're doing it subcutaneously at once or twice a day, depending on how well they're doing, otherwise they stay on the IVs. Um, how to manage gut flora after recovery. That's where probiotics are helpful. If you have access to that, um, if not a little bit of yogurt, but metronidazole um, is super helpful. So I generally send them home with metronidazole for weeks.